here to be here speaking tonight. And it's such a pleasure to be able to do the inaugural discussion series for Kelly, who um, I have learned is really a force of nature. I think it's an amazing thing that she's done to get this organization together because it's really very needed. Um, being a parent of a premature baby and also being an OBGYN, having delivered many premature babies, I really understand, I think, kind of both um, both sides of the coin. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to talk, my talk tonight is mind-body connection. And I'm going to get into that in just a little bit, what that means and what that specifically means for prematurity. But I'm going to start just telling you a little bit about my story so that you understand that I really know where we're coming from. And as Kelly mentioned, I'm the author of The Creamy Primer. And when I was in the hospital with my boys, I had triplets. I was pregnant uh, with triplets in 2003 and woke up uh, just after the July 4th weekend, in fact, knowing that I'd ruptured my membranes, hoping that I hadn't, but as an OBGYN, I knew I had, and I was 22 and a half weeks. And we arrived at the hospital, and I delivered my son, my first son, Aiden, the next day, and he died after three minutes. We elected not to resuscitate him. And then managed to stay pregnant for another uh, three and a half weeks with my remaining two sons, and delivered um, them exactly at 26 weeks. And this is when I first actually became interested in the mind-body connection, because what happened after my boys delivered was I decided that I was going to get to 26 weeks. I didn't know how, but I was going to get there. And obviously there were a lot of drugs involved, a lot of different things, and a lot of really intensive medical care. But every single day and every hour of the day that I was awake, I chanted 26 weeks to myself. I said, I'm going to get there. I had to get up at 4 every morning to get my nifedipine. And as the sun came up, I would say, it's, good. it's not going to be today. We're going to get to 26 weeks. And you know the day that I got my infection and had to be delivered was exactly 26 weeks. Now the odds of that happening, it could have been any day, right? Over the past, over the previous three and a half weeks or the following three weeks, it could have. And then I thought, well, why didn't I pick 27 weeks or 28 <laughs> weeks, for God's sake? But, um, but you know, it's just one of those things that makes you think, you know, your mind does have a little bit more control than you think. And to try to harness every single thing that we have in our being to help our babies and ourselves is really the concept of mind-body connection. So um, this is Oliver, uh, and you can still see the wristbands on my hand there. I was also had a very bad bloodstream infection afterwards, so I was in the intensive care unit at the same time as the boys, so that was really great for my husband, who I think was wondering if anybody was going to come home from the hospital at all. Um, and that's Oliver there, uh, and uh, who was a one pound, uh, 11 and a half ounces. And um, ooh, oh, I guess picture didn't show up in there. How about that? He's going to be very upset if I tell him that. Uh, and, uh, so I won't. Um, and Victor, who was one pound, 13 ounces. And I knew a little bit about the roller coaster ride of prematurity. Obviously, as an OBGYN, I had obviously followed up on many of my patients who delivered prematurely and found out what had happened to them, but was really kind of unprepared really for the gravity of how things really flip-flopped the whole time. And then to make matters worse for us, uh, within a week after birth, Oliver was also diagnosed with a very serious heart defect. His, his PDA, patent ductus arteriosus, closed, but he had a critical pulmonary valve stenosis and had to have surgery on his pulmonary valve. The problem is, is the only thing worse than hearing your son needs to have pulmonary valve surgery is hearing that he's too small to have it. Um, so we had to sort of inch by, gram by gram, until he was 1,200 grams and could have the surgery. And then he had a hole closed in his heart when he was two, and he still needs to have um, a valve replacement. So it's one of those things you're thinking, well, it rains, it just pours. So I want to talk now about, you know, really what the mind-body connection is and, and really what it means to be to me. And just to also to explain my background, I'm also board certified in pain medicine. And we use the mind-body connection a lot in pain medicine uh, because we can really harness our chemicals and hormones to actually change how our body responds to things. And that's really the essence of the mind-body connection, the idea that our thoughts and our emotions influence our physical health. And harnessing this connection actually improves emotional and physical well-being. And it's really a very intuitive thing. If you walk into a room and there's a bunch of angry, anxious people, do you feel better or do you feel worse? 
Well, you pick up on that negative energy, and we actually all feel worse. Uh, when you're angry, your hormones change, and that sends off different signals, and we actually respond to that. We're built to respond. And understanding this can actually also help us understand how we can become sort of more of a dyad with our babies when they're both in the intensive care unit and then later on when they grow up. Because that's really what they are. They're not an independent being. When we're together in close confines with someone and when we're their caregiver, we really form this kind of dyad connection. So I just, I'm not going to go into any really complex sort of stuff about neurotransmitters. Whenever I talk about that, my husband's eyes always glaze over, and he's like, just get to the meat of the subject for me. He's from Texas, too, so um, he's from Houston. Um, but basically, every single thing that happens in our body happens because of chemicals and hormones. How our nerves function, every single, every single impulse that happens, how we walk, how we breathe, how we talk, can actually be broken down to chemicals and hormones. And the thing is, is we can also change those chemicals and hormones by how we think. So if you think about it in another way, well, we change chemicals and hormones with medications. And we can also change chemicals and hormones with our thoughts. And that's really kind of the essence of the mind-body connection, that it's kind of a back way in to actually really affecting changes in our body. So the thing that is the biggest sort of thing that happens to all of us in the intensive care unit, obviously, is emotional distress when you suffer through the loss of a child, when you have a pregnancy that ends not in a way that you wanted, um, because many of us also grieve the pregnancy that wasn't to be. You know, when we're first pregnant, we all think that we're gonna get to, you know, 40 weeks, we're gonna deliver by the light of the moon, and it's gonna be this beautiful, romantic delivery, and everything's gonna be perfect, and there's gonna be wood nymphs, and all this kind of stuff, dancing, and, well, I live in Northern California, so you know, it's a little bit of a different perspective there.